Tonight, <clears throat> we're going to play with, uh, and I mean play, with Plato's Parmenides. Therefore, it's going to be a reflection. The reason I call it a reflection, because I'm reflecting on it. So this is really Plato's dialogue, the Parmenides, that we're going to be looking at. Now, to begin with, I'm going to approach it in a curious way. I'm going to talk about the difference between metaphysics and theology to begin with. Because once you see that, then we can go into it in the way in which I hope will bring some things to light. So, theology inherits the particular language of the religion of which it tries to rationalize. <clears throat> Metaphysics is general, it's indifferent to any particular religion. Therefore, theology is a language that comes out of religions and therefore it has a particular form and quality, which is <clears throat> God. From the idea of God, you can talk about the divine, you can talk about Father, and what other words can you use that you can say belong in the class of God? Well, we can put in a couple of more. <clears throat> Divine, diviners. Um, we can put diviners divinity. as divinity. Right. So there's a class of terms that fit together. But notice the difference when we move to metaphysics because the highest concept or idea of God in metaphysics is the good. <clears throat> or the one. Now, with the idea of good, you can get wholeness, whole, completion. A strange word I want to use tonight, usia. And if it's a wholeness, there's something that's holding together, and therefore it brings things together, binds, bond. <coughs> and uh, not exhausting them all. And in the same way with the idea of one. You have one, oneness, unity, union, communion, unifies, perfects. Now, notice how these terms have a kinship. <clears throat> if I say um, a person, uh, to take a loaf of bread. The whole loaf has some wholeness to it. <clears throat> wholeness means a completion. Completion means there's something that holds it together. Right. That means it must have parts must have been brought together. Now I can move over here and I can say, as a result, a certain oneness occurs. There's a unity of parts. Therefore, there's a union. If the parts relate in a very clear way in, in union, bringing together a union, it's a communion. Therefore, we can talk about unifying, perfects. So these terms have a close kinship with the parent. These, while well, these, diviner, divinity, father, God, don't have that class of unity among its members. And the differences between here, between the members, we can see as slightly different as it proceeds. That's slightly different as it proceeds, and then we can bring it back together again. So let's take a look at what happens when you can take this one idea of the good or the one, and just in one sentence, see what a metaphysician does with it. Right? If the good brings about, brings about the wholeness of all beings, but what makes whole and holds together the usia of each is the one, I move over here, 
Then the good for those it is present to brings completion. One. Brings completion as one and holds together according to the union. So from this language, each term fitting into this class, I can then make statements that are intelligible about the very idea of the good. Now, it's good to move back and forth between the language of theology and the language of metaphysics. So we could say then, since the idea of the good is called, pardon me, the idea of God is called one, God is one, God is good, it is not at all clear that by examining the idea of God that you can find some proof for the fact that God must necessarily be good in one. But in metaphysics it's much easier because the language is very much akin to one another and the terms decline in this way and we can find distinctions within them that allow us to bring ourselves to this kind of a conclusion. Now, I introduce one word here, seer. That's a very interesting word. Right. Would you not agree, right now, we can say, there is something in us that is trying to understand. Right now. There's something in us that's trying to understand. And it's trying to understand, while it's trying to understand this curious subject, it also has a goal to understand itself. Therefore, we have some capability of turning or directing our awareness or consciousness or attention, any one of these words is very good, upon ourselves. <clears throat> In that sense, therefore, it's reflective. Right? It's reflective, right? It's reflexive. That property of being able to direct our awareness, consciousness, attention to ourselves, this turning about, is what we call who see it. Now, <clears throat> that means at the core, at the very basis of reality, there is that aspect of ourselves which is so important to ourselves. So there is something very central to us that inquires about itself, reflects upon ourselves. I'm going to use the word usia to represent that. <clears throat> so when it's complete, notice, when it's complete, it's a unity. When one discovers the nature of oneself, then that process is complete. And therefore, uh, that whatever it is then <clears throat> that makes whole, see that makes whole, this makes whole, it's complete now, it's complete. Now look, we can go back in here. If indeed it's the good that brings about the wholeness of all beings, but what makes whole and holds together this of each is the one, then the good for those it is present who brings completion as one and holds together according to the union. In fact, we have a union. Notice we can play with this. We can stay with this. We can reflect on it. We can stay with it and make connections. Notice when I substitute now theological language, would that be equally interesting to say if indeed God brings about the wholeness of all beings, but what makes whole and holds together this capacity of ours to turn around and see ourselves is the one, then God, for those it is present to, 
uh, brings completion as one and holds together according to the union because when it makes itself complete, would you not agree? It made it a one. It made it one. And so we can f reflect this way on this kind of language because the language of metaphysics uses this kind of language. Now, if we can therefore say what we're interested in exploring tonight is the most fundamental notions of metaphysics, and then we're going to shift back to religious language, then we can talk about God <coughs> and all else. Now, it's difficult to talk about God and all else because that's religious language. I'm going to change that, right? I'm going to call, instead of saying God, though we mean that in the background, as it were, we can say the one. And then we can say all else. We can say others. All right. So therefore, there's one and there's the others. Or well, there's one and many and a manyness. Now, if we use this language now, wouldn't it be interesting to ask this question? Is it possible that we can deal with all the things that may develop if we ask the question, what follows, what follows if we say the one exists or is? Well, we're doing this, aren't we? We're turning and reflecting upon the nature of the one. And then we can say, well, look here. Now that we understand the one, is it possible then we can say, then how is the one related to the others? And then we can say, well, look here, how are the others relating to themselves? And then we can say, look here, how would the others, how do they relate to their source? You know, we can equally raise the question, can we not? Uh, rather than saying, if the one is, we can say, if the one is not. By not, we mean many things, but in this case, we mean does not exist. What follows? And then, what would follow if the one does not exist for the others? And what would happen among the others if the one is not among themselves. And again, what would happen to the others if there is no one? Then how could it possibly relate back to something which is not? So we can say we can take this positively as existing or as not existing. We can take it positively as existing or not existing. And therefore we have eight possibilities to explore. Or I can put it in another way. We can put it now theologically and say, let's take theology now, make it simpler. What follows for God if God exists? Say, what follows if God exists for other things? Say, how do other things relate among themselves if there is a God? 
said, how do the others relate back to the source, God? And of course, I can take the negative side of that, can't I? <clears throat> so then, we have eight possibilities. Well, look here. Suppose we do the easier way of going for this evening. Let's go backwards. Let's say, all right, if the one does not exist, and the others <clears throat> uh, and the others exist. Let me try something. Therefore, we can put it, if the others exist and the one does not, or if the one does not exist and the others do. What would follow? Theologically. Hey, if God doesn't exist, what could we say about the universe? About everything else? Now, we can't say that in terms of the language of theology because it won't work. The language doesn't match. But we can do it with metaphysics. Let's try it. If the others exist and the one does not, well, <laughs> you know what? The others, the others could certainly not be a many. The others could not be a many. Because <laughs> in order to have a many, you'd have to have many ones. And if the one doesn't exist, you couldn't have a many. And you couldn't call you couldn't say the others as one, because you're talking about the others as a class, are you not? You're talking about the others. The others. The set of the the set of others. That's one. Well, then you couldn't say then, strictly speaking, if the one doesn't exist, you can't have a manyness, because if you have a manyness of anything, each one of the manys has to be a one, right? And if there's no one, you can't have any of these ones, and if you don't have any of these ones, you don't have a many. Well, that's pretty clear. Then, if, if the one doesn't exist and the others do, well, then it can either, the others can neither be a one nor a many. Right? No way. Hey, you know what? There could be no communion between the two of them. If, if, if the one doesn't exist, you can't have a communion with something that doesn't exist, not even on Saturday. Right? By the way, it couldn't give the appearance of a one because the whole idea of the one doesn't exist. Well, then you know what? We couldn't say anything about it. We couldn't make any distinctions among the others. No distinctions. Don't make any distinctions. What could we say? We could say, well, you know what? That picture is very interesting. Well, you say, you know what? Then nothing can be said. Therefore, nothing. Nihilism. But fundamentally, a nihilism. Now, look here. Let's change it for a moment. A slight change, a change, slight change. Suppose I were to say, what happens to the other things that the one doesn't exist? 
I don't have to take it that way, which I said before. You know, because look here, if the one does not exist, <clears throat> and the others do, I can say one thing about it. The others are certainly going to be different from that which doesn't exist. That's clear. And if it's different, then it must be other than, must be other than this. Wait a minute. But if this doesn't exist, it has to be different from each of the others. <clears throat> That is to say, difference must reside with the others. Therefore, the whole idea of difference must be, it must be different or other than something. It must be other than another. Each of these, whatever it is, must be each, therefore, different from the other. They must all be different. And therefore, each is uh, other than the other. That's what different means. Each other than the other. Yeah. Now, well, looking at it that way, of course that follows. <clears throat> well then, there would, there would be no bond to it. There'd just be as many as they are, just, just unending. Well, oh. what? Wait a minute. See, if the one does not exist, if the idea of one doesn't exist, the idea of one doesn't exist, then you know what we can say about it? Each is other than the other. So we might say one of them is small. All right? This is small. Oh, by the way, didn't we say that each of these is other than the other? Well, then, this can be other than that, therefore it could be smaller. And this is larger, must be larger than the others. Wait a minute, must be each is other than the other. Well, then I'll have one that's other than that. I'll make it bigger yet, or smaller. Because if each is other than the other, continuously, and each is different from all the others, then whatever I want to say is small must be relative to something that's large. But whatever is large is again going to be only relatively large compared to something else because there isn't anything that is a pure large or the highest or the greatest. For if it were, it would be a distinct one but the one does not exist. Therefore, there's only one thing we can come to. Each appears as a unit, yet even as a unit, even as a unit, each one of these as a unit, its unity only has an appearance of, of unity. Why? Because unity, unit and unity reflects the idea of the one. And if the one does not exist, then it only has the appearance of being a unity and only appearance of being a unit. So therefore, it seems and has the appearance of these things, but not in reality. So this is the, the world, if the one does not exist, and the quality which is characteristic of this kind of a world is difference, and the difference must be in respect to each of the others, such that each other is other than the other, then all of it seems one way and appears one way, and it can equally appear and seem like another way. Therefore, you know what? This is the world of relativism. Right? All is relative. All is in the realm of seeming. Ah, let's take this out. Let's take this out for a moment.
Well, again, if the one is not, what are the consequences in respect to it? What are the consequences to it? Well, if the one is not, then we have to talk about what is not means. If we want to talk about what are the consequences to the one, if it is not, we have to know what we mean by is not. Well, you know what we mean by is not in this case? Well, the absence, the absence of usia, all right, if there is a one, all right, but it doesn't have this capacity, we can't say it has this capacity, then is not means the absence of usia. That's what is not means. Because if we mean by is not, it's the absence of usia in that of which we say it is not. Okay? That's what we mean. Now, if that's true, that we can now talk about a one that is not, and what we mean by that is the absence of usia, it doesn't have that, and it doesn't have that capacity. It can't do that. That's not part of what it is. Well, pretty dumb. <laughs> then, if that's the case, then it neither participates, it can't participate in itself, can it? It can't participate. It can't participate, nor can it cease to participate. Ha <laughs> Look here. Then it can't come into being, nor cease to be. It can't come into being, whereas this would be bringing into being, right? Manifesting itself. Disclosing itself, revealing itself. If it can't do that, you know what? Then it's not capable of any kind of motion. Because this process is some kind of curious motion. I turning upon oneself, reflecting upon oneself. There is some strange kind of reflection motion. Well, <laughs> then it's not in motion. But it's not in rest either. Right? Because it is not. It is not. It can't be in rest or in motion. Right. Well, if that's the case, you see, then uh, now watch what happens when we do this. If it doesn't have this capacity to turn about, then all the things that would follow if it turned about, if it could turn about, it would be. It would be. And if it would be, then you can talk about it in a variety of terms. You can talk about it as being great. You could give all kinds of predicates to it. If it could be, you might say it's like something. Might even talk about it in terms of place or time, if it, if it exists. But if it doesn't have usia, then we can't say any of this. We can't say it's either great or small, neither like nor unlike, not in any place or time. Well, you can't have any knowledge of it. Wouldn't know it. Can't make any judgments, nothing. Well, yeah, that's a real curious one, right? See, let me make sure we see this in one more way, all right? Notice what we're saying. If it could, if it could participate in this, then it would know itself, right? There would be a coming into 
existence, coming into being. Right, we're coming to being. That's what it could do. And to the degree that it can come into being, for however long it can do that, if it's eternal, of course, then it would stay in, in that state. But if it were in time, then it would come into being and pass out of being. That is to say, if you were to say that experience will last a certain period of time, then there's a time when it reveals itself and a time when it isn't. Mm-hmm. Now, if there's a see, if there's a time when it comes into being, there's a time when it comes into being, and then it passes out, and then it comes in and passes out then what we have is a cyclical entity. Or we can look at it with this kind of a sketch. Right. Comes into being, passes out of being, comes into being, passes out of being. Or we could put it positively and use that figure which is familiar to everyone, I think. The yin yang. Right. Comes into being, passes out of being. So it has none of this, has none of this dual passage coming in and, and going out. So it's a it's a denial, and that's the force of the fact that it denies the participation in time. Well, let's take this out now. Let's take this out. So, uh, so this is a, a, a uh, non-cyclical uh, Now, let's try another one. What happens if the one does not exist again? No. Right? If the one is not, what must happen if the one does not exist? Well, you know what? We can say we have to examine this word. Remember before we examined this phrase, is not. Now we just wanted to examine the word is. See. If, for if the one is a not being, then it's different from everything. Ah, it's unlike others. It's like itself. If the one is not, if the one is not, well then, <laughs> we can still, you know what we can do? We, we can uh, study it, even though it is not. Well, we can study it. Uh, let's watch. If God is not, is means existence. Right. Well, a lot of things can be said to be, in some sense, is not. So it's a God that is not. Okay, what's a God that is not? Okay, I got one. Let's say a mythical, a mythical being, a pure fantasy. Well, that's a God that is not. Well, then we can study it. We can study it. No reason why we can't study it. And if we study it, you know what we're going to find? That it's different from everything else. Well, it's going to be different from everything else. Right. And it's going to be unlike going to be like all others. And by the way, we could equally say it's going to be like itself. That is to say, we can study different mythological beings that other religions call gods that we might reject, and therefore we're saying we're studying the god that is not. So we can study it. And we can say, certainly, it's different from everything else. 
It's unlike other things that are. But you know what? It's like itself, and it's like others in its own class, isn't it? Because we can study mythology. So therefore, you know what? We can study it. It's like itself. It belongs in the class like itself. It can be, it can be, it can, we can measure, you know what? We can measure these against others. Some of these deities, make-believe deities may be great. Some may be small. Some may have a variety of forms and shapes. We can learn a great deal about them. Even though we agree, it is not. So, see, for if the one is, it's a not being. Then in one sense, it is. And in another sense, it is not. It's a mythical being. It's a God that is not. Okay, we can study it. We can learn about it. We can learn all the things about it. We can learn where it comes from, who believes it. We can learn a lot of it. Then in one sense, mythical beings, the gods that are not, we can say they have both qualities, both is and is not, even though in each sense we mean it differently. But therefore, it comes into, we can say, it. it, it <clears throat> uh, when any we, anytime we have two contradictory classes like this, it is and it is not, we can say it's, it can be said to be in transition. It's in transition. It's in both, back and forth, back and forth. There's the kind of transition, back and forth. It is, it is not, it is, it is not. Well, then we can say it doesn't move in time and space, but it alters. Therefore, alteration is possible for it. Someone might say, uh, Zeus went from here to there. Zeus did that. For some people, they would say, well, that's a god that is not. You can study it. It's different. It's unlike others. But yet, it's like itself. That is to say, its qualities and characteristics remain constant. It, it is in transition, even though it doesn't move in space and time. And therefore, it alters in some way. So we can learn a lot about it. And we can keep on studying it. Right? We can talk about it being great or small. And therefore, we can talk about the God that is not or the one that is not. And we can make up a category and call it, if you don't mind, I'll say others mythology. <laughs> right? So now look what we have. We can say, theologically, if God is dead, then we experience nihilism. Whole philosophy of nihilism. A whole philosophy of all is relative and there are no absolutes. There's nothing that has any meaningful cycles. It's all dumb, dead. And therefore it's irrational. No basis for finding and discovering any rationality. Everything is irrational. And everything is a lie. Mythology. Everything is a lie. Now, I can call this, just to put numbers on it, I want to call this the ninth, the eighth, the seventh, and the sixth. Because they are nine hypotheses in Parmenides, and I'm working backwards. So, you know, I can arrange them this way, and I think why I'm going to arrange them this way will become clear. The above, six and seven, work on the assumption if the one is not, what are the consequences for it? If the one is not, 
What are the consequences for the others? Now, what if it turns out, as we explore this curious subject tonight, that we can then take the second, third, fourth, and fifth hypothesis and say that if you deny the second hypothesis, you land in the sixth. If you deny the third hypothesis, formally, you land in the seventh. If you deny the fourth, obviously, you land in the eighth. If you deny the fifth, you land in the ninth. That is to say, suppose for the moment there are four possible ways of dealing positively with the idea of God, or the one. Suppose there are only four. And suppose, therefore, we can put them in this way. If you want to deny any of the positive views of the nature of God, then all you have to do is to become familiar with its opposite. If you want to argue against any one of these positive views, we have outlined the proper ones to explore because they match. They're the negative side of the positive. Now, there are other interesting relationships between these that we can talk about, and many people have explored them, by the way. So we really have a curious kind of cube. I have an interesting cube. So then, let's take a look at two, three, four, and five. And, of course, you're going to ask, what happened to the one? Well, that's the pure one, and that's going to be left over for last. So then, what would happen if we take a look at... <clears throat> now, what I'd like to do first is just give you an overview. This is... I'm going to use this symbol for participating. It'll save me writing. All right. if, the, if God or if the one is, that means it participates in this thing we called usia. There's a participation in usia. Now, if there is a participation in the very nature of reality in this the very nature of reality, there is this power to turn and revert upon itself. And we're calling that the one, that is. Then, how does the one, how does the one, then, manifest itself? Among us, others. Well, suppose therefore we have this view that we're going to change the idea of time and say that there is only the instant. Now let's see what I mean by that. What I mean by that is, suppose for a moment that we wanted to study motion, things in motion. And someone said, I know what to do. Let's take a film of something in motion and we can study it in great detail. Then we can really study change. 
And so each one of these frames is one thirty-second. Bang, 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 three of them. And we look at them. Would you agree that each one of these is not in motion? Each one is at rest. Well, that means we didn't go fast enough. So we get a much faster shutter speed, and we get a camera speed that shoots one three hundred and twentieths of a second. But we'd get the same thing, wouldn't we? Therefore, where does the change take place if there is change? It must take place in between. Would that be true if we increased our zeros? We'd have the same problem, wouldn't we? Well, then let's change this talk and say the eye does that too, doesn't it? Just like the camera. Well, then no one has ever seen anything in motion in their life. They infer it. They infer motion from still frames. And no one in their life has ever experienced motion. Well, then, look here. That's because you don't experience motion. That's because what's really going on in the nature of reality is that there's the instant. What you really have is the instantaneous, which has no time. So between anything, see, between anything that we study, right, between anything we study, two frames, put it over here, A, B, C, A, B, then, hey, you know what the nature of reality is? It's flashing, bang, nothingness, bang, comes up again. Like I said, that's all. The whole nature of reality, therefore, is flashing on and off. Well, what does that mean? That means this moment, then, this moment, then, comes out of nothing and returns to it. Right? Look here. That's all it is. This moment, bing. Hey, there you are. Where'd you go? Ha, 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 ha. Where'd you come from? Ha, ha, ha. Oh, I understand where you're coming. You come out of nothingness. Nothing. See? Blank. Blank. So everything then emerges from it and returns to it and the next moment appears and then disappears and another one takes its place. And that's the nature of reality. What we take to be real is only these flashes of something that is coming out of a vast, pure nothingness, which is very pregnant with everything. But we never experience it. Therefore, this is a cycle. See, this is a cycle. Right? There it goes. Continuous. So let us call this the cycle. Now, let's take a moment out and do something else. Now look here. Suppose we now we do something else. Now, once this, once this all appears, and all that appears, then, then uh, it can be entered into groups. That is to say, you and I can enter into groups. 
that things can be arranged in groups, holes. Either you and I, tables and chairs. Right, we arrange them. Look at what they did here. Put all this stuff here, arranged it. So then it appears, all this appears as a whole. A perfect whole. That's what it is. Bang, it's all here. Let's ignore that coming and going of the instant. All right, let's ignore that for a moment. Then each one becomes a part. See, each one of these becomes a part. Right? A part. And each part, each one becomes a part. But it's a part of a whole. And the whole is the sum of the parts. Now, look here. We enter these, let's call them now for the moment, uh, all right, associations. Right. Or totalities. Right. There it is. It's totality. Or some same thing, or some people come together, or tables and chairs and everything else like this comes together as a totality. Something curious about this totality. Then from this one that emerges, from this one that emerges, this becomes this becomes something. This becomes something. This association is a new kind of one. It's a new kind of one. This moment, hey, that's a one. But it's not a pure one. It's a, some kind, it's a new kind of one, some kind of one. Therefore, it's produced, it produces a, a new kind of one. So by joining this group, they gain a association, and as a result, they themselves are changed by being part of the association. Now, the language I want to use now is right here, and I wanted to focus on it now. Right? There is something then that is produced in them all that enter into an association, they're changed by a result of being brought into the association. Therefore, there's a limitation in relation to one another. Each one knows that they're entered into it. And they know that they're different, fundamental principles, they know that they're different. And yet they know that they belong to a whole or a totality. But when left to themselves, they don't have that particular relationship to the totality. <coughs> but when they have it and they're in it, well, then indeed, they have a new kind of unity, a new kind of existence. Therefore, by doing that, they partake in a certain kind of limitation. This is a limitation. Yet when they're alone, independent of that, they're free of that. So they gain something by joining it. Yet when they gain something by joining it, it is also a limitation of their being. So therefore, in that one sense, they're unlimited, one separate and apart from the group. And therefore, they partake of limitation when they join it. So they're both, both experience these double forms. They're both bound, right? They're certainly bound. They're certainly bound. All right, they're certainly bound. All right. All right, they're bound by the limitation of joining the group. And yet when they're free of it, right, when they're free of it, wow. Therefore, they're both like and unlike themselves and one another. Because when they join that group, they know something. They're like themselves. 
when they're apart, and they're unlike themselves when they're part of the group. Therefore, they experience both of these kinds of affections. So they get into a kind of a one, the totality is a kind of a one. Therefore, there's something that's been added to them, yet what's been added to them is limitation. They participate in that, and therefore it's a complete whole. It's a complete whole. It's a complete whole, or we could call it family, genus. Oh. Now look here. If the one is, if the one is, we can say one thing about the relationship now between the one and all the others and just clean this up because we've obviously been making a mistake. All right. There's something fundamentally different about those two. They're separate. Now, taking that one distinction, we can build. Separate. Well, if they're separate, then there's no participation. Agree? There's no participation if they're truly separate. And if they're truly separate, then there's no one in the others. Can't have one in the others. If it's truly separate and can't participate in it, then the others can't be one by participating. So there's no one in them. And yet in the other way, there's neither one nor many, for the same reason we mentioned. Therefore, you can't really say there's any similarity or dissimilarity between the two because they have been so separated, you can't make the comparison. Therefore, you know what, this, this looks like something quite simple. So if the one is, and it's totally separated from the other, then it transcends it. Right? Then it's just transcendental God. Right? They put the God here, right? Therefore, if God is totally separate from all others, then there's no communication between the two. There's no participation between the two. And if there's no participation between the two, the whole idea of interaction, communication, experience, all of that must be denied. So, by the way, if you then say there is no good, I mean, there are no God or one, then you have nihilism, don't you? Say, if there is a real whole, family, kinship, if you deny that one functioning that way, then all is relative. There are no basic things worth being distinguished or distinguishing oneself from the other. It's all relative. If the nature of the divine is cyclical, because you see, in this gap between any two successive moments, if this is what generated it, and if this is what it came out of and what it returns to, then that big in, then that that instant, that instantaneous moment between any two moments right, must be pregnant with all possibilities. There must be some order behind it because it selects amazingly well what's proper at the given moment. And therefore, there must be some intelligibility behind it because each successive moment seems to carry a certain logic and a certain uh, relationship that's going on from moment to moment. So there must be something that persists, right, that stays the same, and yet each moment is different, 
and to maintain that sameness and to give the particular difference that's appropriate for the next second must take place in this instantaneous moment. Behind that there must be a vast intelligence. That is to say, it must be complete. There must be some intelligibility that's complete in itself. That's sufficiently complete. Because, look here, how do you know right now? See, watch. Hey, how, how is it possible that the proper chalk landed there with the right pressure and everything else? What maintained that constancy in the universe? There must be something in there that's aware of itself, that's aware both of what is now and what will come, and what's appropriate to come. Ah, by the way, that's the idea of a seer. A vast intelligence that can reflect upon itself. So then, wait a minute, if that's the case, look what we have here now. A vast intelligence, or an intelligible, or an intelligibility, that allows itself to engage in that moment, the instantaneous, and that provides, as it were, a constant, a constant set of relations. for all kinds of things to be part of the totality. And yet, whatever is there transcends it all. All right, so it transcends it all. So, look here, if it transcends it, therefore it's separate from it, it certainly needs that intelligibility that can then merge in the moment, through the instant, to manifest what was latent within it. Well then, you know what we need? We need an idea of time. That's what we need. We need an idea of time. <clears throat> we need two ideas just for the fun of it, just to play. All right. Eternity and time. I'm going to use three words. Um, cohesive gathers together right. Right. gathers together revelatory perfects now Anything that has any seed-like quality, would you not agree, if the conditions are right, there's something curious about time, right? Time. Because we know how the seed develops, manifests all that was latent within it, so that it reveals, it reveals what was potential, what previously was potential. Seed-like. That's it. Reveals what was previously seed-like. Oh, to do that, it has to gather its necessary parts together, cohesive-like, and keep them going, right? There's the flower, right? There has to be something that binds it together during its various phases of development. 
Ja. And when we look at the whole life of the plant or anything that has emerged in a seed-like development, man, elephants, cucumbers, time given the proper circumstances then in, in allowing all of it to reveal itself, it shows it's, it has the capacity for reaching a certain perfection appropriate to its particular stages. Now, <clears throat> um, eternity, of course, um, eternity is the idea in the mind of God. It's complete. It's a totality. It's complete. It's totality. All creation is just one idea in the mind of God. And time simply parcels it out according to time so it can go through these phases. So therefore, what laid entirely compact exists in one idea simultaneously. Therefore, it's a simultaneous whole. Right? It's a simultaneous whole. Right? It's a simultaneous whole. Totally compact. And therefore, time is nothing other than the unfolding of eternity. It unfolds. Or you can call it, a, as it's uh, sometimes called, time is then the moving image of eternity. Therefore, on a much higher level, eternity is re revelatory. It has everything together cohesively. And it is, as it were, perfect as it is. Time just allows it to reveal itself in that way. Therefore, when we have these categories the way we have it, right, the pre the, this whole structure presupposes the idea of time and eternity. So then we can go back to the model we were playing with and we can say that <clears throat> um, that the, un the, um, the whole cyclical way, the whole cyclical way of the unfoldment of the universe creates the kinds of totalities. It presupposes a vast intelligence. It presupposes a vast intelligence out of which it emerges. It creates totalities once it functions the way it does, unfolding. And yet there is a very basic and fundamental transcendence to the whole thing. Separate, totally. Now, what about the one? Pure one. See, when we said it transcends, it transcends the others. Well then, you know what? This is not a pure one because there are others. What would it be to talk about just the one in itself, apart from others, totally? Just to talk about the one as itself. Pure, a pure one. God independent of creation. God independent of the unfoldment of eternity. Pure one. Well, we could always we could say one thing which is very simple. I mean, we could say one thing, be very clear about it. Have to take this out. We'll start always with just one idea. If one, then not a many. That's all. If one, it's not a many. Therefore, if we say anything about it, and if it looks like that we're attaching something to it, if we're attaching anything to it, it wouldn't be one, it would be one plus you attach to it. So if 
we have an idea of one. It must remain one. And not be joined, <clears throat> associated, mixed, involved, participate with anything other than its own. So if one is not a many, then we can't say it's a whole. Because the whole has parts, that would be saying it has parts, then we would be adding something to it, and saying it has a many, it has many parts. So therefore, this idea of the one that we want must remain a pure one and not be joined with anything in any other way, so that all we can do is talk about it in itself. If you do this systematically with Parmenides, you'll discover nothing can be said about it. That is to say, no term can describe it. Because when you do describe it, you are predicating something to it. Predicating is a fancy word for adding. You're adding something to it. Therefore, the whole idea of the first hypothesis, then, is a set of 14 categories that describe it negatively. So in the end, you can say it's a, it's a pure negativity, which they sometimes call the dia negativa, a god that is defined only in negatives. And therefore, that becomes <clears throat> the pure one. <clears throat> now, what can we do with this? Let's just try something for a moment. Is it possible that we can use these, as it were, colors? <clears throat> as colors are used by painters, or notes by musicians. Sounds. Is it possible that we can... Can we take... Can we take any religion and mix these in such a way that we can describe the particular religion. Can we deny any given religion by having recourse to the denials that we've established. Like, look here, look here. Take Christianity. <clears throat> You'll find, by the way, that there are no religions that have a pure two, three, four, five. But they mix these in various amounts. Like, would you agree, Christianity, uh, membership into it, you get into a complete whole, you join it. In that sense, we can talk about it as the uh, <clears throat> fourth hypothesis. Can we not talk about, let's say, how does God enter into the universe? Well, I don't think God enters into it at all. Are we separate? Oh, okay, then we'll use the fifth. Separate and distinct. Huh? Transcends the universe. Oh, that's a lot like Judaism, except that once in a while God comes in to remind the people of something. Oh, then he enters in, oh, third. He enters into history, he has to enter in through some place, through the moment, to reveal himself in some way. Oh, oh. Can we then use these to create the various kinds? Judaism, Judaism, Christianity, Muslim, 
Are they all, are they all families, groups, joining a totality? And then we can just add various degrees of these. If that's the case, to the degree that this can be done, then to the degree that this can be done, as well as the arguments against them, then uh, Plato concocted something five, you know, 400 BC, fifth century, BC, fourth century, before these religions for the most part existed and laid the metaphysical foundation for them and all other religions that may come as well as how to deny them. So next week I'd like this group to please come in and apply this, right, that's your assignment. Take any religion and see whether you can now go back and see whether we can construct with the dab of uh, two, three, four, and five and create the various religions. Right? We'll have you pay, all papers will be typed, of course. Thank you. I try to wrap it up in as much time as I could. Curious, curious subject. When I mentioned I would do that, do this this week, I, I thought, you know, as much more than you can possibly do in one evening. So I ran through a great deal of material and tried to reduce it so that it was manageable, and I hope I achieved in part that goal. Thank you. Any questions from the floor? Yeah. Um, does the six hypothesis in, in any way relate to the way um, Plato explores belief? the power of belief in the Republic? Oh, uh, is it related to the power of belief? No, no, it's just pure. Um, the sixth one? He doesn't go into what are the conditions someone would hold to any of these. He doesn't do that. So the difference between Plato's Parmenides, well, okay, uh, let me do it. You can also take these and put them this way. The first is the one or the good. The second, the same terms that we used here can be used most clearly to represent intelligence, hyphen being. The third equals soul, taken as a totality. And soul and as a soul and body. So that you can then, if you study Plato's Parmenides then, you learn the language used to describe these different metaphysical realms. And their denial. <laughs> right? And their denial. Now, the point you're raising about belief, <clears throat> uh, he doesn't go into why a particular person would hold this or that. Now the difference between Plato's Parmenides and Plotinus is Plotinus is interested in talking about the transition between these. What's it like? What does it take to climb for a human being to experience and understand both together? Experience and understand soul and body, soul, experience it, experience it and lay oneself open for that state. So what we've suggested here is a departure from that because I thought I'd have a little fun with it with you. The reason why I ask is because you described mythology or I guess Plato describes mythology as both to be and not to be. No, I or use that term. He doesn't use that term. To be or not. No, to okay. be and not to be. 
Yeah, uh, let me make sure. Plato doesn't call uh, the sixth hypothesis my, my okay. mythology. Here, I'll give you a perfect description of it. Um, well, and ought we not next to, to consider what must happen if one does not exist? Yes. What then is the sense of this hypothesis if one does not exist? Is it different in any way from this if not one does not exist? Certainly it's different. Is it merely different or are the two expressions if one does not exist and if one does not exist, complete opposites. Let me do it again. Is it merely different, or are, they two, or are there two expressions? If not one does not exist, and if one does not exist, complete opposites? Yeah, complete opposites. Um, Then, I'm skipping, then we should begin at the beginning by asking, if one is not, one must, what must follow? In the first place, this must be true of the one, that there is knowledge of it, or else not even the meaning of the words, if the one does not exist, would be known, true. And is it not also true that the others differ from the one, or it cannot be said to differ from the others, certainly then the difference belongs to the one in addition to knowledge. For when we said that the one differs from the others, we speak of a difference in the one, not in the others. That's clear. And the non-existent one partakes of that, of some, of this, relation to this, these, and all notions of that sort. All right, therefore, his conclusion. It is impossible for the one to be if it does not exist, but nothing prevents its partaking of many things. Indeed, it must do so if the one is of which we've been speaking. So the one that does not exist, then we can have knowledge of it, doesn't prevent it from participating in many things, even though it doesn't exist. So there's no belief in it. Just straight, this would follow, this would follow, this would follow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.